All right. in this clip. Well, let's take a look. It's an eight-minute clip. Uh, let's look at it right now. She's the minister of South Church, the Unitarian Universalist congregation in Portsmouth. Before moving to New England two and a half years ago, she served several churches around the D.C. Beltway, so she knows firsthand the ill effects of excess carbon emissions. In her first career, she was a nurse midwife working with a low-income adolescent pregnancy population in Washington. Reverend Finkelstein is the current chair of the Unitarian Universalist Action Network of New Hampshire, a statewide social justice advocacy network based on the affirmation of both inherent individual worth and the interconnected web of all existence. Reverend. Thank you. Is this? Yes, okay. So as a parish minister, I come about come about this a little differently from a different perspective. I was thinking about if I did a PowerPoint, what would the slides be? Um, and I decided not to do a PowerPoint as a result. Um, the primary question I ask myself always when we think about involving ourselves as a congregation or as a religious movement in the civic issue is, what does a faithful response look like? What is a faithful response to climate change? And to answer that question, I have to begin with the worldview. So I believe that creation is good, very good even, to use the language of Genesis. And that I believe that just as every human being is born with inherent worth and dignity, so all life is interconnected. That, that's what we believe, that all life is interconnected, that all living creatures and the planet that supports that life and the universe beyond it, all of that is precious and worthy of our very best care. Our life on this earth is a gift. The earth itself is a gift. And we are the stewards of something vast and complex and beautiful and vulnerable. And I think it's our understanding of the vulnerability of, of the life on earth that, that is relatively new to religious people. For me, stewardship is a spiritual discipline. It is being conscious of the fact that the earth we inhabit has intrinsic value. It's not just the value of raw materials that we can take and make into something for human endeavor. There's intrinsic value. We didn't build it. We didn't earn it. But we now know that through carelessness and inattention, we are destroying it. Our job as faithful human beings, as stewards, is to nurture and protect this earth and make sure that we pass it on to the next generation as unsullied as possible. This is not just Unitarian Universalist theology, by the way. Many of my evangelical Christian colleagues have also come to embrace the idea of faithful environmental stewardship. They too believe in the sacredness of creation, in our obligation to be responsible stewards, in the very real danger of unchecked human production and consumption defiling this creation that was deemed very good. Other faiths are also coming to recognize the necessity of a faithful response to the crisis of climate change and global warming. And we will all work together on this issue across denominational lines, across nations, to preserve what we've been giving. Another aspect of worldview is to assert a culture of abundance rather, in a cult rather than a culture of scarcity. This is important because scarcity pits us against each other. Scarcity says that we cannot afford to worry about carbon emissions when the Dow is down. The recent economic news notwithstanding, I personally feel called to reject efforts to parse out such things as sustainability and economic justice as though we can only do one of them at a time. There are those who would have you believe that you, it, that you have to make a choice among these issues. Already we are seeing the news stories that tell us that as people worry more about the economy, climate change and st sustainability fade in importance. I reject the assumption that Americans are capable of only thinking of one important thing at a time. Just as I reject the notion that somehow sustainability is the luxury issue rather than being a matter of basic justice. Sustainability is a matter of justice just as surely as the living wage is a matter of justice. 
I could give you all kinds of statistics or stories that bear this out, and others on the panel have and will do that as well. But I ask you, have you ever seen a toxic waste dump in an upper-class neighborhood? No. It will never happen. The true cost of environmental degradation will always fall disproportionately on lower-income people. The health risks of exposure to pollution, the unpredictability of weather patterns, the danger of flooding or drought, inconsistent food production, you know the litany. Cameron, you talked about the lessons of Katrina. Clearly, the primary lesson is that the best predictor of survival of a natural disaster is your income level. The more money you have, the more likely you are to be able to protect yourself from, from these things. And that is to our shame. For years, the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee has been talking in our congregations about the fact that while we are still very much in love with oil, our grandchildren's wars are probably going to be fought about water, not petroleum. Clean drinking water, water to bathe in, water to irrigate fields. It is a simple matter of justice. We in this nation are the producers and investors and consumers of a disproportionate percentage of the carbon-creating technology on the globe. Sadly, we will not be the people who run out of water first or food. We will not be the people who find themselves trying to till soil that is so depleted or polluted that it can no longer produce even a subsistence crop. But we owe something to those people. And that's why we're here a week before the election that most of us believe is the most momentous of our lifetimes. We are here to address a simple matter of justice, a simple matter of morality. We cannot let any of the candidates from president to senate to congress, we cannot let them forget about our concerns for a sustainable future. I want to say to those of you who are representatives of the campaigns, we who care deeply about sustainability, we are values voters. And our value is a commitment to bring to bear the resources, the energy, and the ideas of the best and the brightest of our generations to halt the degradation of this planet, this gift, and, and to go back to Dr. Wake's terms, bring us down on that chart to that 350. That 350, that's a theological concept as well as a scientific <laughs> concept, and it's one that I think we all have to get behind so that we do have a future to pass on to our children and our grandchildren. Well, that was an interesting clip. Uh, what can you say about the, the clip from your perspective? Well, as I said, it was just an electric moment. And uh, what we didn't see was the final uh, presenter, uh, Stacey Vanderveer. Uh, he, he led in to his own presentation by saying uh, he learned one thing in the evening, which was to never go after Cameron Wake or Roberta Finkelstein. <laughs> Uh, hard to hard to uh, up be uh, be after them because you're upstage. So it was yeah. just an electric moment, and uh, there was a prolonged applause. And I think it really reached people's hearts about the ethical and even moral uh, uh, <clears throat> issue that we have on our hands here. We, not only, I mean, you could say that as, as if we get into debt as a country, we are mortgaging our children's and our grandchildren's future. Yep. Climate change is very similar. We are benefiting from burning these precious assets, these fossil fuels, which have been building up over millennia. We're burning them much faster than they're being replaced, yeah. infinitely more fast. Uh, not only are we using up an asset which we should be preserving for the future, we're putting it into the air, which is having an effect on our climate. So in both of those senses, we're not being res responsible stewards of the future. And I think yeah. Roberta was making that point. Yeah, good point. Excellent. But let's take, let's take a few minutes and let's really focus and bring it right down in New Hampshire. I mean, it's like right now, what's happening in New Hampshire? Uh, how does this affect us in some direct ways? I mean, I have some thoughts about that, but how about you? Well, we've, we've touched on some of them. I think uh, our... our being a, play, a, a cold climate um, with uh, energy prices being what, what they have been and, and they're still very volatile, um, f if, we are, uh, if we were to address the issue of our use of energy, of carbon, hydrocarbon energy, right. 
by burning some of the, uh, the uh,